Have you noticed that people seem pretty irritable these days? Most of us feel a quiet frustration building under our skin, and our nerves are always on edge. And it doesn't take much for us to become upset or offended. And isn't that just exhausting? Well, in this video, we're going to examine how we can live a life of immense joy and peace that Jesus said was available to all people. And no matter who you are or what you believe about God, I believe it's within your reach because Jesus said that even in the frustration and irritation of life, a gentle, restful life is possible. So for many of us at Community Christian Anywhere, we have found this life and centering our life around what Jesus said was the only thing that mattered that you and I would learn how to love everyone always, just as he did. And it's a love that is not easily irritated or offended. And that's what we're going to be looking at throughout this video. Hi, my name is Kelly, and welcome to Community Christian Anywhere. begin with the obvious. Life can be irritating. Difficulties and trouble seem to be an inevitability, everything from waking up late to traffic jams to bad customer service to bad sales service, frustrations abound. And even though they can be incredibly life-giving, some of the most irritating parts of life are, well, other people. It's just natural, but Jesus said the most important thing in life, in fact, the only way to live a good and pleasing life is to love everyone just as he loves us. And so one follower of Jesus named Paul wrote to a group of Jesus followers in the ancient Roman city of Corinth, and he described the love of Jesus in such a beautiful, powerful, and memorable way that it's probably the most famous writing on love in all human history. More than Shakespearean sonnets or Whitney Houston ballads or whatever thoughts Oprah might have about it, these words of an ancient Jewish tent maker named Paul fill wedding ceremonies around the world because they just ring true and they can't be denied. Here's what Paul said. Love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It does not demand its own way. It is not irritable and it keeps no record of being wrong. The love Jesus modeled for you and me, the path to a good and pleasing life, is a love that is not irritable. It's not easily angered or offended. It doesn't hold on to past hurts and resentments. Now notice, Paul doesn't say that love never gets angry, because anger is the emotion we experience when our will is frustrated. Or put simply, anger is what we feel when we don't get what we want. When something doesn't go as I think it should go, or I'm treated unfairly, or I see evil and injustice in the world, anger can actually be a very good thing because the purpose of anger is to provide the energy to deal with the frustration, for me to go and make wrong things right. But anger was never meant to be my primary way of viewing the world. It's meant to be temporary. But irritability is a mood. Moods are longer lasting than emotions. A mood is a predisposition or a tendency to have a certain kind of emotion. Before I know it, a mood becomes a part of my character. Character is what I do without having to think about it. For many of us, irritability has become our defining mood and attitude. And so a quick temper, constant complaints, cutting remarks, aggressive actions, venting our bitterness and disappointment onto others become our default mode of operation. We do it without even thinking about it. Irritability like this is a marriage killer, a relationship ender. It can wreck careers and do damage to those we love, and eventually it can lead to a level of emotional detachment and isolation that leaves us alone and depressed. This is more than just a problem of behavior or a lack of controlling our emotions, where emotions like anger are usually just reactions to something going on around me. A mood is a reflection of what's going on within me. It's a reflection of what kind of thoughts are going on in my head. 
If I'm angry at my coworker because they dropped the ball and I had to work extra hours to cover their mistake, it's most likely just a reaction to my frustration that their mistake caused me extra work. But if I'm always irritable every time my coworker asks my, for my help or even speaks to me, it's not a reaction to some kind of unfairness. It's a reflection of what kind of thoughts fill my mind about them. This is the difference between anger and irritability. Irritability is all about the kind of thoughts I choose to set my mind upon. Imagine your day for a moment. The alarm goes off and your first thought is, seriously? Already? Why do I have to get up this early? Oh, right, because I have three kids that apparently need me to do everything for them. The only me time I get is going to the gym where I can't relax. I have to actually work out so I can justify eating way too many tortilla chips. Not that my husband will care or notice that I worked out anyway, so why should I even bother? He's probably just going to come straight home and hop on the PlayStation while I try to fit in dinner, bath time, and bedtime for three kids. Like I didn't also go to work today too? which I may as well just not do. They clearly aren't going to promote me, so I'm basically working to pay for daycare. Now, that may just be me, but what kind of mood do you think you'll be in all day when this is the narrative running around in your mind? How much patience are you going to have for anyone's mistakes? How much kindness are you going to be able to offer when you feel unappreciated and ignored? How can you deal with a traffic jam or spilled milk or a crying three-year-old when this is the soundtrack of your mind? But let's imagine a different day. You wake up to the sound of one of your children yelling, Mommy, I have to go potty, and another playing in their rooms. Instead of complaining it's too early to be dealing with this and why can't they ever just let me sleep in, you choose to think, I know it's early, but how cute are they? God, you have blessed me with some amazing kids. Sure, it's frustrating to have to get up whenever they call, but they're only this little for so long. I don't want to miss it. I know, I don't want to leave my bed right now, but God, thank you for this warm bed and for my husband who I love who works hard every day. Thank you for my job and my friends and all the blessings I have in my life. All of this is a gift and I never want to take it for granted. <laughs> now let's be honest. That seems like the most unrealistic way of waking up. But why is that? Because we've never chosen it. Here's what I mean. Who's in charge of your mind? Who runs the programming department of your thoughts? Well, that would be you. This is very important when we think about love. The greatest and most important freedom in your life, which nobody can take from you, is the ability to decide what you will focus your thinking on. The Apostle Paul once wrote to a group of Jesus followers in a different ancient Roman city, Philippi, and he told them, fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable, Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. It's as if he's saying, you need to nail your thoughts down. You need to staple good and beautiful and wonderful thoughts to every corner of your mind. And a person who chooses to control the thoughts in their mind, to fix true and honorable thoughts in their minds, they are going to live with a different kind of mood. Imagine beginning your day with thoughts that focus on the beauty of life, that honor the people you love instead of judging them. Imagine the running soundtrack in your mind was the thoughts of gratitude and not complaint. Imagine the voice in your head being full of joy, not sarcasm. What would you think about daily traffic or your children's ingratitude? How would you deal with irritations or mistakes? We too easily give control of our thinking over to our circumstances and our momentary emotions. If I'm tired, I allow my exhaustion to drive my internal dialogue about how tired I am. If I'm frustrated or disappointed, I allow that negativity to craft a narrative about how unfair my life is or how things never go my way. And if I do that enough, it becomes my general mood and attitude towards life and people. And before you know it, I'm an irritable person. An irritable person is someone who is predisposed to become angry. It's a person whose body and attitude is poised and ready to strike out in rage or to vent out grievances. It's a person who flies off the handle about minor mistakes because they have no emotional runway to allow for slip-ups. An irritable person is me, and it's you. But the Apostle Paul says, love is not irritable. 
And here's how it accomplishes this. It keeps no record of being wronged. You and I think of not being irritable as if it's going to take some kind of Herculean effort of strength and will to not just lose it when someone frustrates me. Trust me, I've got four kids under the age of 10. I know what frustration looks like. But remember, frustration isn't the problem. Irritability is. Irritability is a choice to view the world through the eyes of cynicism and resentment. Irritability is bred not out of your frustration in the moment, but out of every moment leading up to the frustration, which is why a love that defeats irritability is a love that keeps no record of being wronged. Human beings are record keepers by nature. We're able to predict future behavior and events based on past experiences, and it's actually a gift. When I place my hand on a hot stove, that pain becomes a memory that protects me from doing it again. And if I ignore that record, I will keep experiencing pain time and time again. And many of us think we're protecting ourselves in the same way when we hold on to a record of wrongs. When I hold on to a grudge or a past hurt, I'm really just protecting myself from ever letting that person do that to me again. Whenever I think about forgiving them and letting go of that resentment towards them, all my mind has to do is replay that memory and my anger keeps me from re releasing that leverage I have over them. And let's be honest, there's an enjoyable feeling of superiority we get to indulge in when we hold on to those bad memories. We get to remember someone else's bad behavior and we savor every thought of how awful they are. Or others of us, we love to wallow in self-pity. Some of us have PhDs in pouting. And we're so skilled at telling the story of our pain to others to increase our feelings of victimhood and increase our moral outrage at this other person. And let me be clear, I'm not saying that we should live in a state of denial about our problems. There is absolutely a need for you to deal with the wrongs that others have done to you. But it is not through rehearsing those wrongs over and over again in your mind. It's through clear boundary setting, open and honest conversations, and maybe even some outside help like a counselor, a therapist, to bring healing to the pain that's been caused to you. If you're in need of any help in this area, please reach out to us through the number you see on screen right now. I'd love to help you figure out how God and our church can help you to heal. But for many of us, we're not taking any of those steps. We're just replaying our record of wrongs like the worst, greatest hits record of all time, which is clearly the Chumbawamba Greatest Hits album. And after a while, the playlist in your mind is just on autopilot. You don't even have to think about it. Your mind is just saturated with it. But love chooses to think on different things. Love is also a record keeper, just of different kinds of thoughts. Love doesn't keep a record of past hurts and resentments. Love doesn't keep a record of everything that went wrong in their life or that annoys them about others or that's broken in the world. Love keeps a record of goodness wholeness. Love fixes its mind on things that are true and good and beautiful and admirable. Love keeps a list of gratitude and things that they find admirable about the people in their lives. Love fills their minds with stories that inspire beauty and wonder in their souls. Love thinks on things that make it easier to be filled with joy and peace and patience, even when their circumstances are difficult or frustrating or annoying. Because a loving person doesn't give away his or her control over their mind to their problems, but to the Spirit of God living within them. And the Spirit of God always reminds us of His goodness and His faithfulness and how every moment in life is a gift that should be cherished. really negative person <laughs> and I used to say it was no I'm a realist people would say you're so negative you're a pessimist and I'd say no I'm a realist <laughs> I'm not a realist I am a pessimist I always you know can see I analyze everything I can always see you know any potential problems like um I joke all the time that I'm like Debbie Downer that like you know I'm like 
Yeah, normally I would, uh, I have a tendency to fall into an overwhelmed and stressed state of mind, which really bogs me down and uh, prevents me from doing anything productive. It just really holds me back. But um, in having school, work, uh, wedding planning, and everything else, it's just that's additional things to worry about. Um, so, just an example our house flooded at the beginning of January, and um, we had to replace all the flooring and a lot of the walls, and our stuff wasn't damaged, but we were displaced for two months. I, I said to my husband the first night, I said, all things work together for good for those who are who love God and are called according to his purpose. And um, I think it was really cool that that was one of the first things that came to my mind because of having done this practice. And, and then I just kept reminding myself of that, like even when I didn't feel that anymore, which happened often, um, like being in a hotel with two small children. Um, you're not thinking like, oh yes, this is gonna work out for the good. It was just really stressful and hard. But, you know, through all of it, I could see how things were, you know, that that overarching theme of like God was doing something. Having done this practice and being able to find the breathing room and the peace of just the day-to-day joys that are presented to me, I'm able to keep going forward and not allow myself to be overwhelmed and stressed out just because I know God's present and he's there with me just by recognizing just many gifts that have been presented to me because I've often felt I've delayed going to school or just kind of general progression and uh, when doing this practice I was able to look back and really see what God's done in my life with uh, I mean just being engaged and you know, going through school now and being able to uh, hold decent grades and have a job where a boss cares about me, I've, I've just been able to see what it's like uh, or see the joys of this stage of life, whereas previously I would have kind of beat myself up over not going to school or working at a job that I don't really like or I, I can't tell you, like, I felt like I was just like seeing things new, you know, like seeing, seeing the world around me, the people I interacted with, like, once I realized that I was kind of predisposed to this negativity and this, this, um, you know, practice made it so glaringly obvious to me how much so that was, you know, my, I was hardwired to think that way. Um, I think that really changed things for me. And that's probably the thing that I'm like, you know, really um has impacted me the most about this practice and then continuing to live it out you know it's like i haven't wanted to stop living like that you know there is a way of viewing life where every day is an irritation every appointment is just another problem on your list of problems to get through every person is likely to let you down or take advantage of you and so they're not to be trusted where worry and stress and disappointment are a constant struggle and the only way to keep you safe is to use your past hurts and resentments as a playbook to avoid future suffering. Well, when this is your thoughts about life, is it any wonder why you have such little patience? Why you give others so little slack? Why you're constantly on the edge of a meltdown? Why every person around you is always walking on eggshells and why you're always feeling defeated? because you can't love others when you view them and all of life as a frustrating problem to be solved. Jesus invites us into another way of viewing the world, where life is a gift from a loving and generous Father who is actively involved in the details of our lives, where He intimately cares about every fear, every care, every tear we cry, and He's always working for our good where every sunrise and sunset, every drop of dew on every blade of grass, every color, every note of music, every savory flavor, every beautiful thing in creation is a reminder of His glory. And it's just another gift to make this life more enjoyable for us, where every person we meet was carefully made in the good and beautiful image of God. And every moment is an opportunity for us to experience God's love more fully as we share that love with his children. What would your mood be when this was your focus in life? 
How would your relationships with God and others and your fundamental experience of life change if you filled your mind with these thoughts? This is one of my daughters. Her name is Heaven, and she is just a bundle of joy. I mean, I mean that in every way possible. She loves to feel joy. She hates to hold on to any bit of anger or sadness or fear, which of course comes with its own set of problems, but you know, she's young, give her a bit of time on that one. But as all my children do, Heaven teaches me a lot of lessons about life. One of those is about how to savor every good thing in life. One day I had made breakfast for my daughters, their favorite, pancakes. And I approach eating the way I approach everything in life. It's a task to be done as quickly as possible so I can get on to the next thing. But not heaven. She was taking the smallest, most delicate little bites of this pancake as if she never wanted it to end. And she had this massive grin stretched across her face every time she took a bite. And her eyes would just close in what I assume was a feeling of pure ecstasy. And heaven slowly opened her eyes and asked me, Daddy, is this called enjoying? And I said, yes, baby, your whole life is called enjoying. And I saw in that moment the wisdom of a child. Pancakes are a good gift from her father who loves her, and so they are to be enjoyed. I know, it's startlingly brilliant, but how often do we miss that simple truth? This life is a gift. Every breath is a gift from our Heavenly Father, and it's to be enjoyed and savored. It's not to be scoffed at as if cynicism and sarcasm are a sign of wisdom and maturity that I've grown past the naivety of enjoying things. It's certainly not meant to be complained about or given over to irritation because it's not precisely the way I want it to be. Life is a precious gift, and your mind and your will are precious gifts that God has given you so that you could choose to fill your mind with delightful, admirable, beautiful, and pure things that would lead you to worship Him. So can I challenge you today to begin filling your mind with a record of rights and not wrongs? Maybe it's creating a journal of delight where you just list things that you enjoy beautiful songs or stories that inspire hope in you or moments from your day that made you feel loved. Maybe fill your environment with images and scents and tastes that you enjoy. Maybe end each day with a journal of gratitude and just start listing things and people and events in your life that you're thankful for. One thing I've done for the past couple of years is that I regularly write letters to people who are important to my life. People who've made an impact on me or who I'm thankful for. And oftentimes, people who have hurt me or frustrated me or I find myself being irritated at. I make a conscious decision to write a letter telling them of all the things I admire about them or the things they've brought into my life that make it better. Because God has given you and me the ability to determine what we fix our thoughts on and love chooses to fix our thoughts on things that lead us to love and joy and peace. And as we do this, as the playlist of our mind shifts, so does my mood. And I don't feel irritable all the time. I'm grateful, I'm joyful, and I'm in a place where I can truly love others like God has loved me because I'm not consumed with trying to make my life less irritating or wallowing in the joy of irritation over how cosmically unfair my life is. I'm enjoying the gift of the life and the people God has given me, and I'm not missing a single moment of it. This kind of life is available for you if you choose it. And here at Community Christian Anywhere, we believe that we best experience a life of love when we find a community of Jesus followers we can be committed to. Because it's in a community where we really learn what it means to love everyone always. And we'd love to help you find a community of people who can help you find all that God has in store for your life. I want to encourage you to reach out to us by texting the number you see on the screen right now. Our speaker for the day would be happy to help you get connected to our community here. You can also go to our website, cccanywhere.com, and click on the card you see that says, Join our Facebook group. That link will take you straight to our Facebook community where you can meet other people who are engaging with our content throughout the week. We'd love to have you join us there. But most importantly, I hope you know that the love we share with others is only possible because of the incredible and powerful love God has for each of us. I don't know you or what you believe about God, but I can promise you this. No matter what you think about God, He can't stop thinking about you.